Good afternoon, everyone. I, maybe I'll start by just giving a little background on what I do. I'll keep it short, and then we can explore more what's going on, questions and answers. So I'm here at NASA Ames. I'm in the Space Science Division. I first came here as a student, as a graduate student, on a summer program um, many, many years ago. Um, I'm interested in the question of the origin of life, and in particular, the possibility that we might find another example of life, a second genesis of life, on another world in our solar system. To me, that's the exciting prospect in planetary science, that we might find a second genesis of life on another world in our solar system. And I emphasize in our solar system, because then we can scoop it up and analyze it. Uh, we can see what its biomolecules are made of. Uh, so that's the big picture question that motivates me. What do I actually do in terms of the day job? I don't, uh, what I do is two things. One is I'm involved in analyzing data from missions. Uh, right now, Curiosity, as we search and drill for organics on Mars. Also, the Titan mission, the Huygens probe, and Phoenix before Curiosity. So the worlds that I want to go to are Mars, Europa, Enceladus, and Titan. I think those are the big four worlds with something that may tell us about second genesis. The one I would give a gold star to is Enceladus. In fact, that's the one world where we know all the major requirements for habitability are met liquid water, organic material, carbon source, biologically available nitrogen, and an energy source. So hooray for Enceladus. If I could go anywhere, get a sample, bring it back, that's where I'd go. So that's one part of what I do is I, I'm involved in missions, planning for missions, advocating for missions, participating in missions, analyzing data uh, for missions. And that's uh, one of the great things uh, about NASA is that we do missions. I'm also involved in going to environments on Earth that are analogs for these places that we're studying. Unfortunately, the other planets in our solar system are not like Miami Beach or the Bay Area. They're cold and they're dry. They're not very hospitable. So we have to go to cold and dry and not very hospitable places on Earth in order to understand the possibility of life on these other worlds. So if it's cold and dry, I want to go there and study how life survives. So we do field work in the Atacama Desert, in the Namib Desert, other deserts, every desert, and the polar regions, the dry valleys of Antarctic, the Arctic, and so on. So cold, cold and dry, dry, hot and dry, those are places we go, and we try to understand how microbial life survives in these environments. So in a nutshell, that's what I do. Um, so maybe uh, at this point, I'll see if there's any questions or any other comments on the screen. From Kara, what's the difference between a chemical that's biologically available and a regular old chemical? That's a very good question. And it's a question we need to keep in mind when we look at habitability of other worlds. Nitrogen is the molecule that usually comes up in this context. On Mars, there is nitrogen in the atmosphere, N2. But N2 is so hard for microbes to get, and the level on Mars is so low that it's not biologically available. Whereas if there was nitrate on Mars, it would be biologically available. On Earth, organisms do access the nitrogen, the N2, but on Earth, the concentration of nitrogen gas is thousands of times higher than it is on Mars. So just having the elements there isn't enough. They have to be there in a form or in a concentration that organisms can get to. So for example, carbon could be in the form of diamond, but there's no organism that we know that can consume diamond as its carbon source. The difference between biologically available and just a regular chemical. Next question, something you might go into a bit. Uh, the debate about if Enceladus activity actually has a large 
liquid water in contact with the rocky core or not? That's a good point. Does, is there really evidence for liquid water on Enceladus? I would say yes, and I would say yes based on recent results from Cassini. Uh, I think it was the E7 flyby when they went in real close and they collected large particles from near the base of the plume. And those particles were largely salty water droplets. And to me, this was the compelling evidence that the source of the water was liquid. And the presence of these salts in the liquid, I think, was good evidence that uh, the liquid is in contact with rock. So I, at that point, I think we have a good story. It's as good as the evidence for an ocean on Europa. Uh, the next question. You are involved with so many different projects. What keeps... What keeps you going in so many different avenues of research? This question from Adam. Well, it does appear that I'm going in many different directions. But in fact, there is a method to this madness. I'm really going only in one direction, at least the way I see it, which is I'm searching for a second genesis of life on other worlds. The reason it appears I'm going in many different directions is because that problem, that one problem, um, involves many different aspects. It involves biology, understanding how life grows in extreme environments, it involves studying analogs, it involves space missions, it involves technology, it involves act, politically act action to push for these missions. But I have a way of unifying it all, at least in my head. It's all related to searching for a second genesis of life on other worlds. Next question, uh, can we think of a deep drilling mission to Mars in the coming years? Yes, 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 I support that uh, very strongly. And I think the results from the John Klein site on MSL show us that. You've all seen the pictures of the John Klein site. The surface is red, we drilled down a few centimeters and it was gray. Hooray, but so far no evidence of organics in that gray stuff. The organics are probably being destroyed by something that has to do with cosmic ray exposure. But if we could get a meter or two meters down, we'd be below that organic layer. So it's clear to me that the way to move the Mars question forward is Mars on the ground. Um, so then the next question is, what are the types of environments in mind for future Mars exploration? Well, that's directly related to the one I just, same question I just said. I think the environments we should be focusing on Mars or underground. We need to be drilling into the subsurface. That's where we're going to find organic biomarkers preserved. Uh, the surface of Mars is unfortunately an oxidizing, destructive, organic, hostile, life hostile place. And it appears we need to get down below the cosmic ray depth in order to get away from that. So pardon our dust, but dig we must. Uh, question, are you, and you covered the next question I was going to ask, comparison between salts and earth and the salts on Europa. Okay, yeah. Europa is also a place where we know there's an ocean. Enceladus, on Europa, the evidence is strong that the, Euro the ocean is everywhere on Europa. It's a global ocean. On Enceladus, it is almost certainly not a global ocean. The other thing we know about Europa is that the ocean is persistent through Europa's history, probably. Whereas on Enceladus, we're not sure how long that subsurface liquid reservoir has persisted. And that's an interesting question from the point of view of the origin of life. How long does it take life to get started? We have no idea. How long has there been an ocean on Enceladus? We have no idea. But two things on which we have no idea doesn't mean they're equal. Uh, question, how dissimilar might the second genesis of life be from Terranian biochemistry? Yeah, how would you characterize it? That is a brilliant question. How different could it be? Uh, well, some people argue that it can't be different at all, that there is only one way for biology to work, for chemistry to make biology. There's only one way for chemistry to make biology, and that's us. And no matter where chemistry starts, it's going to end up in the same point that we're at because evolutionary pressures are going to push it to this. There's one mountain, and the top of the mountain is one point, and we're it. And no matter where you start, when you climb that fitness landscape, you're going to end up on the same point. We can't say that that argument is wrong, but I don't think it's right. All you have to do is grab Leninger's biochemistry book and take a look at it and realize that biochemistry is an incredibly complicated subject. 
the notion that it would only have one peak in a fitness landscape is hard to imagine. So I think there could be differences. And one case I'll put out just as an example, kind of a simple, trivial example, but it's a proof in principle that life could be different, is imagine life that has exactly the opposite chirality than life on Earth has. So life on Earth has left-handed amino acids in its sugars, or sorry, in its proteins, and right-handed sugars in its polysaccharides. Imagine life where that's just flipped. It's right-handed amino acids, left-handed sugars. Everything would work fine. Now, to actually get to your question, how might it be different? Well, suppose it still uses amino acids, but it doesn't use right or left, it uses right, but maybe it doesn't even use the same 20 that Earth life uses. There's arguments that of the 20 amino acids that dominate proteins on life on Earth, that 10 of them might be primordial, but 10 of them seem to be biologically selected. And it's highly unlikely that a different biology would select the same 10. So that's a way in which it could be very similar, but distinctly different. Uh, it might even be that it doesn't use amino acids at all. It uses some other chemistry to do its molecular machines. And we, life on Earth, uses amino acids to make <coughs> proteins, and we use proteins as molecular machines. Uh, construction, uh, containment, uh, transfer machines. We use them as, to, to think of in terms of kids, we use them as bricks and trucks and, and wagons. We use proteins for that. Uh, some other chemistry might use other organics for that process. Maybe uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons could be used for many of those same processes. So I think it could be very different. And from my own personal perspective, the more different it is, the better. The weirder, the better. Okay, next question was, what direction do you want to see the future Mars missions and science going? Drilling. If uh, I was selecting the next set of missions to Mars, I would insist that there be at least a one meter drill on the next mission to Mars. Even if it's a very simple drill, one meter drill, 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 drill. Next question, can we think of deep drilling? Yes, certainly uh, my demands are modest. I just want one meter on the next mission, but having done one meter, I'd like to increase by an order of magnitude in depth, say, every decade. So this decade, we drill a meter. Next decade, we drill 10. Next decade, we drill 100. Then 1,000. Uh, there's no fundamental reason why that can't be done. And it, by the way, drilling is one of those things that humans are very good at. Hands and fingers, useful for drilling. Uh, question. There is some excess alkyl components in meteorites, so we might expect there to be the same for other life in the solar system. But, uh, it's a good point. We don't understand how it is that life on Earth uses L amino acids. Uh, it could just be a random choice. Got to pick one. Or there could be some predisposition in the meteorites for certain amino acids. What we don't see in the meteorites, though, is large-scale chiral excess of a whole class of meteorites, of amino acids, such as you see in life on Earth. Life on Earth, we see 20 amino acids, all of which are left. That would be the signature of life. If we go to Mars, we find organic material, and there's amino acids in it, and say there's 18 or 22 or 20 amino acids that are in higher concentration, and all of them have a chiral excess in one direction, that is very, very interesting, and I would argue is evidence of life. We don't see that in the meteorite. In the meteorite, we see small excess in one or two. It could almost be random. So uh, it's a whole set of them and all in the same chiral excess. Uh, what do you think the possibility of having a serpentization system as the core, a rock weather around the surface of the uh, Good question. The question is, let me rephrase the question, what could be providing the energy, chemical energy, to support life in Enceladus? The best model reaction system we have for that is called serpentization, where water uh, reacts with uh, iron and rocks, to create hydrogen, and the hydrogen reacts with CO2 to create methane and methanogen, make it go, and they provide the basis for the biology. And we know of two ecosystems on Earth that are isolated from the surface that work on this chemistry. 
So it's a very good model for Enceladus. Uh, from Adam is, what's your opinion of the ExoMars rover drill? Well, I'm a fan of any drill. Uh, and so the ExoMars drill is a very ambitious drill. It will land in an equatorial region and will go down two meters in the sediment. So if the Europeans can succeed in ExoMars, I think that's great. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad drill, uh, except maybe a dentist drill. Uh, question, do you agree with selecting the Mars drilling mission over the time mission and why? Okay, time is a mission to Titan, to land in the lake of Titan. Uh, and now this, is a, this, this question puts me in a tight spot. And that's the, how do you prioritize between one planet and another? If we're only talking about Mars, then I can say, here's what I think we ought to do, we ought to drill. But when you say, well, and then if we're talking about Titan, I say, yay, let's land in a lake in Titan. But then you say, well, what if you can only do one of those? That's sort of a Sophie's choice. Do we send a boat to Titan? Do we send a plume to a, a mission to the plume of Enceladus? Or do we send a drill to Mars if we can only do one? So that's a very hard choice. And there, I don't think one person or one community can make the choice. We have to all collectively make the choice. Well, so I get a vote. I'm part of the community. If I was voting for what would be the number one target at the system level for astrobiology, it would not be time, it would not be Mars, it would be Enceladus. Because there we see all their criteria for uh, habitability. So comparing at the level of the whole solar system, my priority is Enceladus. The level of Mars, my priority is drilling. But if I was given one mission, I would send it to Enceladus right now. Next question, what is the Icebreaker Life Mission to Mars? The Icebreaker Life Mission to Mars is a mission that we've been developing for drilling on Mars. So we're not just talking about it. We actually are doing a mission design for drilling. And we've designed a drill called the Icebreaker Drill, uh, which could drill through frozen ground on Mars, but it could also drill through rock or loose dirt. And it could drill very nicely through the John Klein sediments. I uh, call the icebreaker drill. And we, we fortunately got some ACE step funding from NASA headquarters to develop the drill. It was developed by a company in Pasadena called Honeybee. They developed the drill. And we took it to Antarctica and tested it. And it was great. The penguins loved it. Um, and we drilled down a meter in ice cemented ground that was Mars like. And we're ready to send that drill to Mars. So we've got a mission ready to go. If Mars is on the agenda and drilling is a priority, we've got a drill that we'd like to go. Uh, the next question is about InSight, the next mission to Mars. It's not going to do drilling. That's right. And I think that is a failure in strategic planning. I think drilling is the way to go. But InSight's still a great mission, but it'd be even better if it did. Uh, and I just got slogged off the computer. Okay, sorry. Uh, Inside will do good, interesting stuff, but I, if I, from an astrobiology point of view and my personal point of view, I would advocate drilling. Uh, next question was, how long do you think were the shortest periods of stable liquid water on the surface of Mars? Uh, can you think of permanent deep crust hydrothermal systems? Uh, those are two, two different questions, both interesting in terms of the history of water on Mars. We don't know how long water was on Mars, but we know that it was a long period in geological sense, long enough to carve channels. Uh, and that means that from a biology point of view, it's very, very long. Uh, from the origin of life point of view, we don't know because we don't know how long it took life to get started. But from a biology growth and evolution point of view, water on Mars was there a long time, millions, billions of years. Uh, we don't know how many millions or if it reached a billion, but we know it was a long time compared to the life an evolutionary time scale of life. Uh, can we think of permanent deep hydrothermal systems on Mars? We can think of them. We don't have any evidence that they're there. Uh, it would be really nice if they were there, and then we could drill down to them if we had a powerful drill. Uh, question is, why are you interested in the John Klein sediments? The John Klein is named after an engineer at JPL, by the way, who died just before the mission and who was involved in MSL. His name was John Klein. So this site on Mars is called 
John Klein. Uh, and what's so exciting about John Klein, it was our first glimpse of what I call gray Mars. Everywhere we've been on Mars heretofore, we've seen what I call red Mars. Red, Viking was red, Viking 2 was red, Pathfinder was red. All the places that MER rovers went to were red, with the trivial exception of the white stuff underneath the red. It was all oxidized. We, we were exploring an oxidized, rusty old planet. We landed Curiosity, and it was on that same <coughs> rusty old planet. Rock Ness, the first sample we did was a sand dune, and it was red all the way through. At John Klein, we drilled, a, the surface was red, but when we drilled, it was gray. It was the first gray stuff we've seen on Mars. And you may make fun of this unsophisticated characterization of Mars as into red and gray, but there's actually an important story there. The red stuff is oxidized. It's been, organics have been destroyed. The, the gray stuff is unoxidized. And tellingly, the meteorites on Earth that we have that came from Mars, they're all gray. In the lobby of my building, there's a Mars meteorite. It's not red, it's gray. They sample gray Mars because those impacts that bring us those meteorites penetrate deep below the surface. Well, we want to get into that gray Mars in sediments, not volcanic rocks like the meteorites. That's what John Klein is. Unfortunately, it looks like to really see the story in these gray sediments, we need to be a meter down to get away from the cosmic rays. But I'm very excited that we even reached the gray stuff. And I was surprised that we reached it so easily at that site, just a, a few centimeters down. Question. Uh, Related with your repeated mentions of the John Klein rocks, would you send Icebreaker to Gale? Yes, good question. Uh, before we drilled at John Klein, if, if they were to come to me and say, where do you want to put Icebreaker? I would have said, at the Phoenix site, 68 degrees north. But now, if they were to come to me and say, where would you send the Icebreaker drill? I'd say, I'd land it right on top of Curiosity right now and drill right down where John Klein is down a meter into that gray stuff to see if there's any biomarkers down below the level of organic degradation. And I'd hammer on the engineers. Well, I wouldn't hammer on them. I'd politely ask the engineers to extend the drill to two meters instead of one so that we'd really be sure to get below the cosmic ray penetration depth. So, yes, good point. Uh, when there's new data, change your view. And I changed mine. When I saw John Klein, I said, that's now my favorite site. Uh, it's kind of like the kid whose favorite flavor of ice cream is the ice cream he just ate. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, stable liquid water can occur in pulses. Can you carve valley in pulses, not permanent liquid water? Good question, and the answer is yes. And we can see this happening in deserts on Earth. If you go to the Mojave Desert on Earth, uh, it's dry. 99% of the times I've gone to the Mojave, it's dry. One time I went there, it was a flash flood, uh, and I almost got stuck in it. Uh, but those flash floods, which occur very infrequently, they are the ones that carve the channels. We also see this in the Antarctic dry valleys. It's cold, dry most of the year, but in summer, for one week, the water flows, and they, that's what carves the channels. So, yes, indeed. There is much ambiguity involved with the definition of life. For you personally, how do you define it? I have given up trying to define life. You can understand why it's hard to define life by trying to define another four-letter word, fire. Fire is also very hard to define, especially a definition that would encompass such things as, say, the sun. Is the sun a fire? Uh, a cigarette smolding, an ember, an ash, a big fire, a firestorm. It's it's hard to get a good definition of any sort of dynamic process like fire or like life. On the other hand, uh, you're pretty sure when you uh, get onto a fire that you're out of fire. Uh, and I think that'll be the same case for life. So instead of defining what it is, I think it's more useful to define what does it need and then search for that. It needs water, it needs carbon, it needs uh, energy, and it needs elements like nitrogen and so on. And that's the way to base a search. And then how do you recognize it when you find it? 
Well, I think you the best approach is to look at it at the buildings it leaves behind. Look at the buildings it leaves behind. And what do I mean by buildings? Buildings are things you build. What does life build? Life builds big complex molecules like DNA or proteins. If you think of a protein as a structure of molecules against the landscape of prebiotic chemistry, it would stand out like a skyscraper standing out in a rubble of rocks. It is that sophisticated compared to simple organics. A single protein molecule. So we look for buildings, the molecular buildings produced by life forms. So that's the approach I would take to, to searching for life. Don't define it. Define what it needs and search for it by looking at what it builds. You will know them by what they build is my motto when it comes to searching for life. And what they build is organic equivalent of skyscrapers. We call them proteins and nucleic acids and other polymers, biological polymers. Uh, question, how geographically short pulses can be in terms of the water? Well, they can be quite short. They, pulses of water might, in the Mojave, they might last for an hour, hour and a half, and that's it. Uh, and you may see one every decade or two. Uh, in the Antarctic, they're more predictable. They occur every summer. They might last a week. So there's no, no limit. Uh, question from Carly. Hi, Carly. How you doing? Uh, catching this a bit late. Got stuck in the lab. It's good to be stuck in the lab if you're going to be stuck anywhere. It's better than being stuck in the lab than being stuck in traffic. Uh, but that's not a question. You're just saying hi. Hi, Carly. Hope you're doing well. Where are you in school? Uh, Okay, back to a real question from Kara. How do you think asteroid mining, what do you think asteroid mining, NASA funded in the private sector, will affect the future of science? Well, I look at asteroid mining, and in fact, all these commercial activities going on, uh, flybys, Mars, whatever, as an opportunity for science to catch a ride. Uh, the last time I went to Antarctica, for example, I caught a ride on what was essentially a tourist flight. There's a company in South Africa that flies tourists to Antarctica, and the tourists buy tickets. Well, because of that infrastructure, mostly supported by tourists, we scientists can also buy tickets, and we can go and do our science there at much less cost than if we had to develop the whole infrastructure ourselves. So hooray for any commercial activity in space, because it will develop infrastructure, and then us poor scientists can buy tickets and slots and payload capability at a fraction of the cost that it does to do missions. So that's my view of it. I agree it's a, it's a selfish view from a science only, but that's because I'm a scientist. Okay, uh, will it enable, the rest of Kara's question, will it enable more easily exploration of Mars and Enceladus? And I think yes, because the biggest challenge of getting to anywhere in the solar system is getting off Earth. And so, uh, if companies like SpaceX make that step easier, then everything else is easier. The next question is Enceladus versus Europa. Again, this is sort of a Sophie's choice. They're both very interesting. They're, they're great worlds. Right now, if I had to choose, I would go with Enceladus because there, and only there, do we have all the requirements for habitability. And only there can we move the focus of our work beyond determining habitability to determine inhabitation? So in Europa, we're still asking, is it habitable? On Mars, we're still asking, is it or was it habitable? On Enceladus, we already know the answer to that. And now we're asking, is it inhabited? And I think that's a much more interesting question. So that's why I would uh, go to Europa. Now, why am I saying Europa? We don't know that it's habitable. All we know about Europa is that it has water. We don't know about a carbon source. We don't know about an energy source. And we don't know about a nitrogen source in the water. So that's why I would say that we're still determining the habitability of Europa. Uh, another question from Kara. How do you believe life started on Earth? I think it's a mystery. I think my answer is we don't have a clue. Uh, we're not even sure that life that's on Earth now started on Earth. For all we know, it could have started elsewhere and been carried to Earth, 
or to have started on Earth, uh, it's uh, it's not uh, it, the problem is completely unconstrained. Next question: How do you get C, N, P, S on Enceladus? Good question. C and N we see directly. We see them directly on Enceladus in the plume. There's carbon and nitrogen-bearing compounds in the plume. Phosphorus, we don't have direct evidence of phosphorus, uh, but because we have evidence of the salts that the uh, water is in contact with the rocks, it's likely that phosphorus is available too. And sulfur, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I don't consider sulfur a key biological requirement. So I would stop my list of requirements as C, N, and P. Uh, and, and I would, each one is uh, more important than the former. So carbon is the most important, then nitrogen, then phosphorus, and I'd make sulfur less. Now, it depends on what kind of microbe you are. Some microbes really are into sulfur, but there's a lot of microbes that really couldn't care less about sulfur, whereas there isn't any microbe that won't need P or N. Uh, there are some amino acids that use sulfur, but I think you could get around. Uh, Julie, where do you think the future missions to Mars will go? Uh, that's a good question. It's hard to predict. I hope they'll go to drilling, and I hope there will be a merging of NASA's two Mars programs. We have two Mars programs now. One about that talks about humans that doesn't do much besides view graphs, and one that does go to Mars but is... Uh, resistant to including humans at all. It's antagonistic to humans. Uh, at some point, it would be nice to put those together so that we had one Mars program, uh, but that seems to be a very difficult uh, union to make. Uh, can, can you mention a microbe that does not need sulfur? No, I can't. I can mention microbes that don't use much of it, like, say, cyanobacteria, photosynthetic cyanobacteria that live in the deserts. Uh, don't need much sulfur. They don't metabolize sulfur. They don't use sulfur in any essential uh, energy pathways. Uh, they probably have some small levels of sulfur in their amino acids. Uh, but uh, that's not the same as saying that sulfur is an absolute requirement for life. Uh, on Earth, it's easy to get, so everybody uses it. There are some organisms that metabolize sulfur, and then, of course, that's their bread and butter. But there's many organisms that don't. From Julie, what are your thoughts for man missions versus more robotic missions? Uh, that's, I think, a question of balance. Uh, I'm an advocate of human exploration, not because humans do better science. I think that's a silly argument to rate human existence solely on the basis of how well we do science is to denigrate the value of human existence. Human existence is a value of its own, and science is a way to contribute to that value, not the other way around. So I think humans ought to explore the solar system because that's part of the human experience. So the question is, is how do we prepare for that? How do we do it? And how much do we use machines to prepare for our exploration? And that's going to depend on money and time and a bunch of other things. So I, I, I refuse to believe that there is a dichotomy, and I refuse to put the question that humans should be compared to robots in terms of science as a meaningful question um, around that. And, and sulfur is likely to be there as well. Next question. Do we, do we see Mission to Mars bringing samples in the near future? Sample return. Ah, sample returns from Mars. Uh, indeed. Uh, that's almost an unsolvable problem. And the reason it's unsolvable is because, from an engineering point of view, sample return, the first sample return from Mars, must be a simple sample return. But the science community has almost 100% lined up against the idea of a simple sample return. Uh, I think because they believe that there will only be one sample return in all of human history. So they want it to be the complete glorious sample return. But the engineers can't do the complete glorious sample return. They can only do a very simple sample return. And we don't seem to be able to cross that divide. 
So until we can cross that divide, until the engineers either invent magic missions that can do things that we can't do now, or the scientists realize that they should advocate for a simple first sample return and then improve capabilities over time, I don't think we'll get to sample return. Uh, next question from Kara, what do you do in Antarctica? And have you ever had to fight off a penguin? Uh, I've never had to fight off a penguin. Uh, they, are, uh, they have no natural enemies on land. And they're curious, but they're not aggressive. We did once get stuck for three days at a penguin colony. And they make a lot of noise. Yak and yak and yak, 24-7. Other than that, uh, it's fine. They're delightful to look at for the first couple hours. But then uh, you're ready to go home. Uh, what do we do in Antarctica? The reason we work in Antarctica is as an analog to Mars. There, I think we find the best environments in the dry valleys, and in particular in the high elevations of the dry valleys. We find the best environments to compare to Mars from the point of view of biogeochemistry. And so studying those environments, I think, is motivated by this comparison to Mars. Uh, would you go to Mars if given the chance? I would go to Mars if given the chance as long as the trip was short. I can barely tolerate a 15-hour plane flight from California to New Zealand. So I'm not up for a six-month trip to Mars. I want the engineers to get it down to, say, 10 days. If you can get the trip time down to 10 days, I'm ready to go. Uh, I don't mind how long we have to stay on Mars. Just get the trip done down to 10 days. And that doesn't violate any fundamental laws of physics. It just means we have to get beyond rockets and use other means of transportation, things which don't carry their fuel with them. Uh, someday we'll look back and people will wonder, why did they use rockets? Rockets are intrinsically inefficient because they carry their fuel with them. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Are there any places on Earth without life all the time? Well, that's a tricky question. Uh, and it's the distinction between habitable and having life and sterile. There's no place on Earth that I think is sterile, but there's many places on Earth where I think life won't grow. Those are not where, where, where the environment is not habitable. For example, I'm sitting at Sanjoy's desk. His desk is not a habitable environment. Nothing will grow on this desk unless he spills water on it. Uh, nothing would grow here because the water activity on this desk is way, way below the minimum for life. And because it's not outside, and assuming he doesn't spill his drink, there is never liquid water on the surface of this desk. It is an uninhabitable environment. But it is certainly not sterile, unless Sanjoy has cleaned it very recently. And if I were to take a swab off this desk, I would certainly find microorganisms. So on Earth, we have to distinguish between habitable and inhabited or sterile. Uh, this desktop is not sterile, but it's not habitable. So back to your question, let me answer it this way. There's no place on Earth we've ever found that's sterile in terms of the surface. But there's many places on Earth that we've found that are uninhabitable. Most of those places are human constructions where we've created an environment that never gets water. But we also find a few in nature, where we find environments where it is never habitable. They're not sterile, because just like the desk isn't sterile. OK, uh, next question from Kara. Do you use the Atacama Desert in Chile as an analog to Mars is the same way as using Antarctica as an analog? Yes, that's a very good observation. The At Atacama Desert in Chile is of interest because it is the driest place on Earth. And it is much, much drier than any place else. The core region of the Atacama is so dry that when we first got data back from it, I didn't believe the sensors were working. Uh, and this is from after many years of Antarctic data and data from other deserts. It is much drier than anywhere in Antarctica, much drier than any other desert. It is really quite remarkably dry. And it's kind of funny. It's just a hour and a, the driest place in the Atacama 
It was about an hour and a half drive on a well-paved road from the airport in Antofagasta, Chile. It's trivial to get to, and yet it's one of the cornerstones of our understanding of extreme environments on Earth. Pretty cool. I recommend the trip to everybody. Uh, next question. Should the planetary protection policy be enforced on the privately funded missions? In fact, it is. Planetary protection is a treaty, part of the Moon Treaty, and the United States is a signatory to that treaty. And all citizens of the United States are bound by U.S. treaties. So we see this in Antarctica. If you go to Antarctica and you're a U.S. citizen, whether you're with a U.S. expedition or not, if you violate the Antarctic Treaty, you are subject to federal prosecution. The same would be true in the Space Treaty. So yes, the law of planetary protection, because it derives from the Space Treaty, and because the U.S. signed that treaty, is binding on all U.S. persons and corporations. Uh, how that gets implemented isn't so clear. Currently, planetary protection is implemented within an office in NASA. Well, obviously, that office in NASA can't control a private company. So some other mechanism is going to have to be developed. Uh, what that is isn't clear, and it'll probably be invented when it's needed. Uh, next question. Every surface potentially infected can become a habitable environment. Uh, well, I'm not sure what that means. Certainly, uh, every surface that has something on it, if it becomes habitable, then that life could grow. That's true. But Sanjoy's desk here is, I wouldn't say it's infected, but it has life on it. But it will never become a habitable environment until somebody adds water which I can do if I can find a cup. I just pour it all over his desk, and it will then be a habitable environment, but he probably wouldn't appreciate it. Uh, next question. This is actually a question we need. I guess it's from Julie. We need progress in propulsion and gravity for splay platforms larger than capsules. Uh, it's very tempting and without, a, and without a reason to jeopardize successful possibilities. Having in mind Apollo technologies, we have to send a team to Mars. And I guess the emphasis at that point is we need to enhance our technological capabilities, and I agree. If you think about what can we send to Mars, it's actually pretty pitiful. We can put one and a half tons on the surface as a rover, and we celebrate that. Oh, it's a great thing to celebrate, and I'm glad it was successful, and my hat's off to the engineers that made that landing. But if you think about it, the entire civilization on Earth and all we can send to Mars is one and a half tons. And that's the size of my uh, old Volvo. Right? Certainly we can do better than that. And I think that's what this question is getting at. If we're going to get serious about space, we have to get serious about sending stuff around. And I think that's the good news is that SpaceX uh, is leading the way in that philosophy. And their Dragon capsule should be able to land on Mars. And that's a lot of stuff. That's a big capsule. It's still not as big as I would like, and it still takes longer to get there than I would like, but it's a step in the right direction, and it's been a long time coming. We've been trying to go to Mars for 40 years, and we're just getting up to one and a half tons. Uh, that's pretty embarrassing. Uh, next question. Do you think it is our right as humans to terraform other planets? Wherever. What would the ethics be of terraforming a planet like Mars? That's a good question, and it gets to the question of what is the role of humans and what is the role of life. And let me start with the what is the role of life first, because I think we can only understand what is the role of humans after we have an understanding of what is the role of life and the value of life. And I would submit, and this is not a scientific conclusion, this is a personal ethical perspective, that life is the basis of value in the universe. When we look at the universe, we see many wondrous and amazing things. But the only thing that can be at core a source of value in an ethical sense, in a moral sense, is life. Now, if you take that position, then you ask, what is the role of humans? I think that from the first conclusion, it derives my second answer 
the role of humans is to enhance the richness and diversity of life in the universe. That is the role of humans. And we contribute to that because of our unique skills. We haven't done a good job so far in enhancing the richness and diversity of life in the universe. I would give us a, uh, a D. But we're only young. We're only in our terrible twos. So you know, we have some years to go to catch up and make up for our early mistakes. But that should be our goal. Now, viewed in that perspective, I think, I'm not sure, but I think terraforming Mars does contribute to the richness and diversity of life in the universe. And so that is my question to should we and why should we. For Kara, the most tempting issue is birth control on Mars. Okay, well, I'll let you guys debate that later. I'm too old to be interested in that. Uh, next question. Atacama is the driest place on Earth, yet it harbors life. Microbes on the desert, uh, on the desk, could survive uh, out of dew and condensation as many endless do. Very good point. Very good point. Unfortunately, in Sanjay's office, there is no dew and there is no condensation. The humidity in this room is kept well below the deliquescence of salt and dew does not condense. Uh, poor design, if you ask me. This room is obviously catering only for humans and ignoring the needs of its microbial inhabitants. But your point is actually really good. In the Atacama, we were surprised to find organisms that live in salt where they derive their water from condensation of humidity in the deliquescent salt, and they live on that water. So life is very adept at getting at the liquid, however the liquid gets produced. And in the Atacama, one of the things we've learned by studying it is there is liquid water in places we hadn't appreciated it, and with processes that we don't appreciate. And dew and condensation and deliquescence of salt are the key ones. Other than chemical rockets, the only method for launching large objects in space is throwing nukes out the back. Well, I don't know if that's the only method. Uh, laser propulsion is, is, is another method where you shine a laser beam, light sails,